Great, well it's time for our sermon, so why don't we begin with a prayer. Father God, thank you for your grace to us in the Lord Jesus. Thank you for the truths you teach us through him. Please would you help me to explain them humbly and we pray you'd help us all to hear your truth and give us faith, we pray. Help us to understand and know you, we ask. In Jesus' name, Amen. I wonder if you've ever had to tell someone something really difficult that you were dreading having to tell them, even though you knew it was true. That's what Jesus is going to do for us today. There's a famous book in the last century, in the 20th century, called How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. It's one of those books that I bet no one's ever read, but everyone knows the title of. So here's the title for my talk for today. How to Lose Friends and Incite People. <laughs> We're doing this series in John's Gospel called Encounters with Jesus. First people encountering Jesus, finding out more about who he is. But the crowds are they going to find out some things and they're not going to like it. The beginning of this conversation, these people are Christians. It says this, to the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, these are believers. But by the end of the conversation, about 30 verses later, it says this. At this, they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself slipping away from the temple grounds. Now that is an, a massive turnaround. How do you take people who adore you, who are idolising, who listen to every word, who call you, they say they're believers in you, and within a simple conversation, they're now wanting to murder you? Well, the reason is because Jesus has got some difficult truths, three difficult truths to teach us. And it might just be that by the end of hearing those three, you would have stoned him too. We'll find out. Um, my good friend Doug at church uh, gave me a book to read recently, which I've really enjoyed, all about um, receiving feedback. And it's really about how to receive criticism. So whether it's your wife or whether it's people you work with, how to listen to people criticising you, but do it with humility and listen to what they have to say. And if you're able to do it with humility and listen, then you have a chance to change. But if you react badly then you, you lose that, miss that opportunity. And my exhortation to you as I begin this sermon is, Jesus is going to say some difficult truths. Is there some way, please, that you could listen to them with humility? Because they are true and they're for your good if you listen. But as we see, the crowds wouldn't and they just respond with anger. I hope that's not you. Well, the three truths that he says he begins with a, a, a clear statement he says each time truly truly I say to you and then he says it or literally in the Greek it's amen amen I say to you and this is absolutely true are you listening to this statement so I'm going to ask Nathan now to, to do the reading we can listen to Nathan do the reading of this conversation and see if you can spot the three times Jesus says very truly I say to you and see what that true statement is. Let's listen to it now. Today's reading is from John 8, verses 31 to 58. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are looking for a way to kill me, because you have no room for my word. I am telling you what I have seen in the father's presence, and you are doing what you have heard from your father. Abraham is our father, they answered. If you were Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you would do what Abraham did. As it is, you are looking for a way to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the works of your own father. We are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I have come here from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry and you want to carry out your father's desires. 
He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no tr that there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of a sin? If I am telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. The Jews answered him, Aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon-possessed? I am not possessed by a demon, said Jesus, but I honour my father and you dishonour me. I am not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Very truly I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. At this they exclaimed, Now we know that you are demon-possessed. Abraham died and so did the prophets, yet you say that whoever obeys your word will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died and so did the prophet, prophets. Who do you think you are? Jesus replied, If I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you did not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, it would be, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and obey his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. You are not yet fifty years old, they, they said to him, and you have seen Abraham? Very truly I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. At this they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. That first truth was this. Everyone is a slave to sin. Everyone is a slave to sin. Jesus, Jesus had said this at the beginning. So the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, verse 31, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, then you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. So this is all about freedom and wanting to be free. The truth will set you free. Hold on a minute. What do you mean set free? We are free. We're all free. We are, we are free to think. We're free to decide. We're free to do what we want. We're all free people, right? The Western world values itself on the, um, the, the option or the ability to have liberty, freedom. It's one of the, the, the basic tenets of Western civilization: liberty. And we often actually look down at, say, Russia or China, where there's less freedom, less liberty. We call ourselves the free world. We're the free world. As if we prize this possibly more than any other value. And Jesus has a very hard truth for us. And here's the hard truth. Amen, amen. Very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now, in the week of the George Floyd protests, slavery is an emotive topic. You need to see here that Jesus is not condoning slavery. In fact, he's suggesting it's good to be free so that slavery is a bad thing. And they get really upset by being called slaves. So this, the undertone to this passage is that slavery is a bad thing. But here's the challenging thing. Jesus is using slavery as a spiritual metaphor, not a physical one. And he's not just saying black, but any white, black, all people, he's saying, are slaves to sin. They work for and are owned by sin. Now, what does he mean by that? The Jews are really offended when he says this. They said, we're Abraham's descendants. We've never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we should be set free? Now, that's a laughable statement in one sense, because clearly there were slaves in Egypt at the time of Moses and even in the times of Jesus. The Romans are their bosses. They're slaves to the Romans. Now, I would have said that back, but Jesus doesn't. He doesn't answer them what they say. He answers to their heart, the, the deeper root issue underneath what they're saying. They're talking about their freedom and they say Abraham is our father. See, our identity is our people and who we are means we are a free people. Now, that's exactly what the British say, isn't it? Britons never, never, never shall be slaves. That's what we all say. As Western people, we all think we're free people. But here's what Jesus says to our identity. He says to the Jews, if you were Abraham's children, then you would do what Abraham did. As it is... You're looking for a way to kill me. A man has just told you the truth I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the works of your own father. 
Now we'll come on to who that own father is in a moment. But here's the point he's making. Abraham's descendants are not just people who have Abraham's DNA going through their blood. Abraham's true descendants are people who act as Abraham did, and they're not. Here's the underlying point he's making. See if you can understand this. If you think you are free and you understand the difference between right and wrong, then answer me this. Why is it you don't always do what's right? If you know wrong and you know right and you're totally free and you're able to control yourself totally, why is it that you don't always and only do good? Why is it you do bad? That's the point he's making to them. And that's a very salient point for all of us, isn't it? The, the classic challenges. I, I challenge you for one week. Could you live for one week, given your freedom, only to do good? Could you do that? Could you live a week without ever being selfish or unkind or thinking a nasty thought or saying a heart hurtful thing? Could you live a week without any pride or jealousy or anger? I bet most of us couldn't do a whole day. See, the underlying reality of our lives shows that we are not free. We're slaves. We're slaves to sin. We sin, we do wrong, and we just can't help it. And that is true of everyone, all people. Now, if you're willing to accept the fact that you are a sinner and a slave to sin, that you can't do what you ought to do, and if you then come to Jesus, then the truth will set you free. This is part of what it is to become a Christian, you see. Most of us have to live in denial. We have to lie about ourselves and to ourselves in order to think well of ourselves. Maybe we have to admit or, or pretend to ourselves that what we do isn't that bad or, or, we, or we deflect it. Oh, he's, he's worse than me or at least I'm not a murderer or lots of other people do it. We deflect and, and lie and try to put on a cover for ourselves as much as for everyone else. But you see, if you're able to accept this truth that Jesus teaches, that we're all slaves to sin, and this is what Christians are doing. I'm a sinner. I can tell you that now on camera. If you're able to do that, then it sets you free. Because now I don't have to pretend. I don't have to put on a mask and try to look all holy. Because I'm a sinner. And so are you, friend. Could you accept that hard truth of Jesus? But he goes on and it, and it gets harder. They react badly to what he said in verse 41. They say, the only father we have is God himself. Well, it was Abraham a minute ago, but now it's God. But anyway, he doesn't stick on that. Here's what he says. If God were your father, you would love me, for I've come here from God. I haven't come on my own. God sent me. Why is my own language not clear to you? Because you're unable to hear what I say. Now you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. There's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And you know that phrase, like father, like son. Jesus is saying to a group of believers, Christians, your true father, the one you're taking after, the one you're like, is actually the devil. And your actions will prove it. Of course, by the end of this conversation, they're going to try and kill him. Their actions will prove it. The devil is not, you know, a pointy little imp with, you know, a fork in his hand. The devil is described here by Jesus as a murderer and a liar, the father of lies. Right back at the beginning of the Bible. Jesus murdered, sorry, Jesus, <laughs> the devil murdered Adam and Eve. And he did, it's not by killing them, but they died when they wouldn't have died because they followed his lies. It's the lies that led to the death. And his lies were, God is bad and God is a liar. That's what he said. Don't listen to his word. Don't listen to his truth. Now, that's exactly the same stark uh, option that the listeners to Jesus had and so we do today. Will I listen to Jesus' truth? Will I accept his truth? Or will I listen to, well, the, the devil's lies about Jesus' truth? 
which will I choose? The second truth is this, only Jesus can give you eternal life. Only Jesus can give you eternal life. So after being told these difficult truths that they're following the devil and that they're slaves to sin, the people listen to Jesus instead of being humble, instead of listening to the truth and thinking, oh, that probably right. Instead, they've got proud, they've got offended, they get angry and they start insulting Jesus. Verse 48, are we right in saying you're a Samaritan and demon possessed? Now, Samaritan, calling someone a Samaritan if you're a Jew, is a racist slur. Calling someone demon possessed is just, you call me following the devil? Now you're demon possessed. It's just petty and it's calling him evil. And actually, the, the truths, for example, that we're hearing in, in the wake of the George Floyd death, some of those are hard truths. And for particularly for white people, we need to be humble and try and listen. It's really hard to do that. It's really hard, actually. If we find ourselves just getting angry and offended and insulting, it's because we're not listening. We often don't want to listen. We don't want to change. But Jesus, in his response, does not insult back. He's gracious back. It's just, he just says it plainly. Verse 49, I'm not possessed by a demon, but I honour my father and you dishonour me. I'm not possessed by a demon. I'm not doing anything wrong here. I'm not trying to kill anyone here. In fact, I'm going to keep on honouring my father, God, and you are going to just keep slurring me and dishonouring me. Jesus is a model, actually, in how Christians should debate with someone who's not Christian. He is kind and gracious, even in the face of their insult and their rudeness and their anger and their offence. But the second difficult truth is what he says next. And here it is. Ready? Amen. Amen. Very truly, I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. For anyone who's humble and willing to self-reflect, to admit their sin and their need of salvation, Jesus offers eternal life. The first truth is that we're sinners. The second truth is that only Jesus can save us. Now, none of us can achieve eternal life without Jesus. That's the hard truth he's saying. You cannot achieve eternal life without him giving it to you. You can't achieve it by being successful in business. Your pay grade does not translate into a heaven grade. If you're good at business, well done, but it will not help. You cannot achieve eternal life by being beautiful or by being muscly or by being good looking. People may love you now for a few years, but God sees through the makeup. It won't work. And you can't achieve eternal life by having the perfect home or the perfect car or the perfect holiday. It might be the people on your street think, well, he's, he's doing well, she's doing well. But God doesn't think that. It doesn't work. You might feel good about yourself. If you've tried to be religious, either as a Christian or a religious person or a non-religious person. I mean, it might be that you've run marathons for charity and you feel good about yourself for doing that. Or maybe you've lit hundreds of candles in a church or, or you've been on pilgrimages to distant countries. Or maybe you've sung with amazing passion and you're really connected with God in a worship session. Or maybe you've read loads of books by really complicated theologians. All those things might make you feel good. But none of those will help you achieve eternal life. Not one of them. A couple of weeks ago when I preached here, um, we had a um, lovely bouquet of flowers um, and they were given to us as a gift. They came to us anonymously in the post from someone at church and I've no idea who they came from. If you're listening, whoever you are, that's really kind. We were really touched by that. Here's what's annoying. We get some flowers. They're anonymous. And we're thinking, oh no, who are they from? So we start texting a few people, was it you? Was it you? Was it you? Because we really want to find out. Why do we really want to find out? Because deep down we want to pay them back some way. We want to give them some flowers or do something nice to say thank you to them. Do you know, I praise God that actually I've still no idea who gave us those flowers. I praise God for two reasons. Number one, because we actually thought there's so many people in our church, so many lovely people, it really could have been any of them, which is a really nice thought. But secondly, even more importantly than that, it taught us and reminded us that we have to receive things by grace. It showed us our, our deep pride, if I'm honest, in wanting to pay back 
My mum said to me something wise the other day. She said, it's much harder to receive than it is to give. It's easier to give than it is to receive. And she's right. And that is true with what Jesus is saying here with this difficult truth. Only I can give you eternal life. The only way you will not die is by trusting in me. And because of our pride, it's hard to do that. By nature, we all want to earn. We want to stand our own two feet. But you can't do that with eternal life. You just have to accept it from Jesus. And if you can accept that truth, then that truth will set you free. You get to live in the freedom of knowing that your sins are taken away. The burden is gone if you just accept the free gift. You don't have to live with the, can I achieve or can I make it or can I be good enough? It's gone. You're free because Jesus offers eternal life for free. The third truth is this. Jesus is God. Jesus is God. So these Christians who have believed in Jesus are now livid with rage. They do not want to hear any more of Jesus' truths. Now we know you're demon possessed. Abraham died and so did the prophets. Yet you say that anyone who obeys your word will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died. So did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are, Jesus? Now, there's nothing worse than an arrogant person who thinks they're above everybody else and looks down their nose at other people. And that's what they think Jesus is being like. And maybe you think that's what Jesus is being like as well. Maybe in your heart of hearts you're thinking, who is Jesus to tell me I'm a slave to sin? Who is he to tell me I'm like the devil? Who is he to tell me I need to be saved? But I, I want you to see that these people, their anger is born out of the fact that they don't want to listen. They're not humble. Here's how Jesus replies to them. If I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. Not me that glorifies my father as myself, he's saying. My father, who you claim is your God, he's the one that glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. But, but I do know him and I obey his word. See, I'm not trying to big myself up here, Jesus. I'm not trying to get everyone to look at me and think I'm better than everyone else. I just, I just am. God sent me. God glorifies me. I'm the son of God. It's, I'm just telling you what's true. It's just saying what's right. And it's the next phrase then that, that really pushes their buttons. Look what he says next. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. You see, they'd accused Jesus of thinking himself better than Abraham. And you know what Jesus says? He says, yeah, I am. In fact, Abraham looked forward to me coming. If you read the Bible, Abraham, 1500 years old before Jesus, the father of the Jew Jewish race. God had promised him that one day he would have a descendant that would be the Messiah. And then when the Messiah comes, Abraham would have so many children, they'd be like the number of stars in the night sky or the, the number of grains of sand on a beach. In other words, Abraham lived his whole life looking forward to the Messiah coming. And Jesus said he was looking, he was looking forward for me coming. It's all about me. It's, it's just the way it is. It's just true. <laughs> now they're, they're right on the edge at this point, the Jews. They say to him, you are not yet 50 years old and you have seen Abraham? And get ready for this last truth. Amen. Amen. Very truly, I tell you, before Abraham was born, I am. <laughs> That was the final climactic moment. They're now picking up rocks and they're chucking them at him as he makes a runner for the, for the edge of the temple and slips out. Now, why are they blowing up at that? Why is that the straw that breaks the camel's back? In the Old Testament, God's name, Jehovah, Yahweh, means literally, I am. Jesus is saying, before Abraham was, I am. I am God. That's what he's saying. In fact, he's even saying that when Abraham was looking forward to the time of Jesus, Jesus was there watching him looking forward to the time he would come. 
Jesus is Jehovah. Jesus is God. Jesus is the I am. Now, when the Jehovah's Witnesses come knocking at your door, classically, the difference between Jehovah's Witnesses and Christians is that Jehovah's Witnesses deny that Jesus is God. So here's what you should do. You should say to them, OK, Jehovah's Witness, what does Jehovah mean? I am. What did Jesus mean when he said before Abraham was born, I am? And why did the Jews want to pick up stones to kill him for saying it? It's because Jesus is claiming to be God. Now, it's possible to accept difficult truth number one, I'm a sinner, and difficult truth number two, only Jesus can save me, and yet deny difficult truth number three, that Jesus is God. But being a Christian means you believe that Jesus is not only your saviour, but your Lord. It means you don't only just trust him that you get eternal life, but you worship him as well. And next week, when Tim gives us a story of chapter nine, we'll see a story of a blind man who both understands his own sin, his need for salvation by Jesus. And by the end of chapter nine, he is worshipping Jesus. Jesus is God. It's absolutely right. Now, look, these are three difficult truths. And as I said at the very beginning, they are hard to hear. And maybe you're someone who hasn't yet decided they want to be a Christian and not just ready yet. And you've got real issues with some of the things that I've said here. If that's you and you've got to the end of this sermon, it's great. Thank you so much for listening. Can I make a suggestion? We're wanting to start a course called Life Explored. Here's a video trailer to give you a taste for what it's like. going to start in two Tuesdays time. Tuesday the 16th at 8.30 in the evening. We're going to do it on Zoom. It's a seven week course which you watch a video and you get to discuss openly whatever you think. You're not going to be told what to think and you get to weigh up the evidence for yourself. It's a way of exploring all sorts of issues about life, life after death, fulfilment, contentment, you know, what, how is how has our world come about? All those kinds of big questions. You're allowed to say whatever you want and think whatever you want. Why don't you do this? If this has stirred you up, this is the time to, to get in touch. Why don't you email us at hello at hopechurchsutton.org.uk. Hello at hopechurchsutton.org.uk and ask us about it. We'd love to sign you up. It's absolutely free. Listen, why don't I pray to finish? I think we should pray. Let's pray. Oh Lord Jesus, thank you that you always speak the truth even when it's hard and even when we really need to hear it. And of course, you do that because you love us. I want to pray for my own heart. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. Thank you for showing me that. And I know that the only way I can have eternal life is because you give it to me for free. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you that you've helped me to come to realise and see that you are God and therefore Lord Jesus I we worship you 
and acknowledge you as the Lord, the Lord of all. I pray for those who are listening for whom this is new or hard. I pray you'd give them humility and help them to see and understand and process. And ultimately, I pray you'd help them to believe. And I ask this in your good name. Amen.